Well, it finally happened. I got my invitation to Hogwarts. Better late than never, I suppose. Hey there, gamers. I'm probably Senpai, and today we're diving into the world of Hogwarts Legacy. So buckle up and grab the reins of your Thestrals because it's about to be a wild ride. As most memorable tales, our story starts with the magic of character creation. I did my best to make my character look like me, except tougher and more heroic. So nothing like me. And of course, I suddenly realize I had yet to give my wizard name any thought. Uh, I guess I'm gonna go with, uh, Senpai, um, Huckus. Yeah, yeah, Senpai Huckus the wizard. After sorting that out, we were on our way. We then find ourselves meeting Professor Fig, a Hogwarts professor and tutor to Senpai Huckus. You've been practicing the spells we worked on. I have, Professor. She and George Osric, an unimportant bureaucrat pencil pusher from the Ministry of Magic. <laughs> Eleazar! Just kidding, I'm sure he's very important to the story. After some light conversation about the Goblin Rebellion and Professor Fig's wife, Mr. Osric reveals a strange, magically charged capsule. Professor Fig and Mr. Osric must have left their ancient magic glasses at home because I could clearly see it glowing and they could not. Upon handing it off to me, I open it up and I find what seems to be a magical key. But then things take a sudden turn. So yeah, George Osric, um, certainly dead here, but that's a pretty cool way to go if you think about it. They'll probably be talking about that at the Ministry for ages to come. Lucky for Professor Fig and myself, that magical key we found happened to be a port key. Not really an ideal time to mourn, but pretty sure the man driving that carriage is also bathing in dragon flame, or possibly splattered on a mountainside somewhere. Absolutely beautiful graphics though. At this point, Professor Fig and myself continue to explore the ruins the port key delivered us to, still pondering why we've been brought here. Eventually, we stumble upon a wall, emanating the same ancient magic we witnessed earlier. You know, when we almost died? So of course I decided to interact with it, and now suddenly found ourselves deep within the Bank of Gringotts, awakening a polite and cheerful goblin banker. The banker proceeds to lead us through the bank and to a very special, very protected vault. Then he promptly seals us inside, claiming that's what he's supposed to do. Sure, uh, thanks for following orders, I guess. Like any great teacher, Professor Fig realizes this is a perfect learning opportunity, and he decides to teach me Revelio. No time like the present. Let's see what we're missing, shall we? Casting Revelio, we find yet another door emanating ancient magic. Despite several near-death experiences, Professor Fig is thrilled to discover the secrets of the vault. If what you can see reveals the way forward, then I dare say we are about to discover the secret of this vault. Activating the door, we find ourselves in a room black as night. Professor Fig's wand lights the ground around us with the spell Lumos. At this point, Professor Fig finally proclaims, This is no ordinary vault. Wow, with intellect like that, no wonder he's a professor. Moving forward through the darkness, we stumble upon rather large and ominous armored statues. Finding that we can align them with their reflections, Professor Fig teaches me Lumos so I can help out rather than just stand around gawking. Though, to be honest, I think I just made matters worse. Upon aligning the statues, we find ourselves at the end of the blades of the ominous armored statues, and with that, I get my first taste of combat. The parries and spell casting left me craving more. Luckily for me, more was soon to follow, and amidst the heat of combat, I was able to master the spell Stupefy. Allowing for a more powerful counterattack. After absolutely dominating those pathetic armored suits, I managed to summon a door that led me into the heart of the vault chamber. Within the chamber lied a pensive for viewing memories, and Professor Fig and myself were able to uncover the secrets the vault had protected so fiercely. The memory reveals a conversation between Charles Rookwood and Percival Rackham. We are entrusting the one who embarks on this path with powerful secrets, with knowledge others will do anything to obtain. They speak on the vault only being discoverable to those who can see an ancient magic such as Percival. They go on to state that only one worthy of the knowledge could pass the vault's trials. After viewing the memory, Professor Figs begins to piece together that I am somehow the key to understanding this ancient magic and those who pursue it. But before we're able to get into that much detail, we were lucky enough to receive an adorable little visitor, Ranrock, the leader of the Goblin Rebellion. An absolutely adorable little guy. 
was quite happy to see us in the vault as he had been patiently waiting for someone to open it all of these years. Unfortunately for him, the vault had other plans. Serious plans. A vicious battle breaks out between Ranrock's fighters and the enchanted armor. Thanks to my lightning fast intuition, Professor Fig and I used this opportunity to quietly exit. Fortunately, the magical exit we took led us directly to our original destination, Hogwarts. Just, uh, too bad for George Osric that we had to take the long way, you know? Because he might still be here if it had been different. Finally arriving at Hogwarts, Professor Fig fits me with an outfit and requests that I keep everything that happened quiet. With that, it was off to the sorting ceremony. But not quite before meeting the headmaster, Phineas Nigelus Black. Black wastes no time ridiculing our tutor for being tardy. And upon Fig trying to explain to Black what had happened, Black just states that he has no time for rumors and is losing patience. <laughs> Yo, Fig just watched his friend die right before his eyes and escaped a war zone a few hours ago just to show up to work and get chewed out by his boss. What a Monday. After being escorted into the main hall, I finally get a chance to don the sorting hat. The hat proceeds to call me old, tells me I have preconceptions, expectations, but it does state that I am undaunted by challenges. And with that, I am sorted into House Hufflepuff. After finally getting sorted, Professor Weasley escorts me to the Hufflepuff dormitories and explains how to enter, and then suggests that I get some sleep before my big day tomorrow. Waking up the following morning, I start my day by exploring the Hufflepuff dorms and conversing with my peers, some of which are rather interesting. I also make sure to take time to eat every single apple and pastry I can find. Sorry, I have a sweet tooth and it was a tough day yesterday. Upon leaving my dorm, I was greeted by Professor Weasley once again. She encourages me to study hard for my owls and bestows to me an extraordinary book called The Wizard's Field Guide. Since I'm starting Hogwarts as a fifth year, Professor Weasley states I'll need this book to master all that's expected of me. I was certainly quick to put the field guide to use running around Hogwarts uncovering secrets and points of interest. It's extremely fortunate that I received this guide considering how easily I would have gotten lost within the halls of the school. After a bit of exploration, it was finally time for class. Today we are attending Charms and Defense Against the Dark Arts. I just had to start with Defense Against the Dark Arts, especially after what we had just witnessed. Goblins, dragons, enchanted armor, angry headmasters. It was enough to encourage me to defend myself. No, Professor Cat was old, but that did not mean she was weak. I'm sure she was about to teach us some seriously powerful magic. I mean, we are fifth years after all. I can only imagine the absolute power- Levioso, Levioso. Okay, I thought the same thing, but hear me out. Levioso. You just got levioso uh. Magical air combos might make levioso my favorite spell. After our first lesson, Professor Hakat decided it would be ideal for me, a brand new and relatively inexperienced student, to face off against a seasoned duelist with five years Hogwarts experience. <laughs> he never stood a chance. After leviosoing Sebastian into defeat, oh. Oh. Levioso. We were off to our next class, but not before he recognized me as a superior duelist and invited me to participate in an underground dueling ring. I will definitely look forward to checking that out later. For now, it was time to head to Charms class, which is where I met Natty, a capable student from House Gryffindor who was friendly and quick to help. And then I met Professor Ronan, the Charms teacher. Natty was cool, but Professor Ronan thought it was fun to ask questions I couldn't possibly know and then yanked the textbook away from me when I tried to learn. I'm afraid it is too late to study now. I just got here. Kind of rude and your jokes suck, but whatever. My, the summer months must have really taken a toll on you all. <laughs> By the looks of it, you all spent your holidays practicing Obliviate on one another. <laughs> uh, hmm. Luckily, what Ronan lacked in comedy, he made up for in cool spells, as it was time for him to teach us Akio, the summoning spell. Shortly after learning Akio, Natty and myself were able to have some friendly competition with a game called Summoner's Court. In the first game, I was proud to say I absolutely dominated Natty. In fact, I beat her so bad that I intentionally threw the second game to spare her the shame of defeat. Yep. 
That loss was on purpose because I'm a really, really good guy. Now that classes were done, it was time to head back to Professor Weasley, but not before a quick pit stop by the underground dueling ring. With the taste of defeat, or uh, the taste of an intentional loss still fresh on my tongue, I was in need of a victory. My first duel was actually a 2v2, not what I had expected, but fun nonetheless. I also wasn't expecting the organizer of the dueling club to be a 12 year old boy, but hey, I'm not judging, that kid is going places. Arriving a bit late to Professor Weasley's office, she didn't expect a thing. There's definitely not a 12 year old running an illegal fighting ring among fifth year students to determine who's the best duelist or anything, okay? <laughs> Professor Weasley informed me that it was time to head to Hogsmeade to get my first one, among a few other things, and stop bothering with the hand-me-downs. She then stated she had seen me spending time with Sebastian and Natty and asked who I'd like to go on my trip to Hogsmeade with. How long had she been watching me? How much does she know about the dueling ring? Is she on to us? I promptly chose Natty to keep her off my trail. Plus, Natty was way more capable than Sebastian. If things went south, I wouldn't want that second-rate duelist with me. Professor Weasley requested I check in with Professor Ronan one last time before starting my trip. It was on my way to Ronan that I learned I can alter the cosmetic appearance of any garment or armor I find. Wow, this game was truly magical. Youthful violence, bureaucrat-eating dragons, and clothing alteration? This game truly has everything. After experimenting with my outfits, I finally checked in with Ronan, who had me gather a few flying pages and then agreed to teach me the repair spell, Repero. With that, I added a few more entries to my field guide and helped a fellow student named Lenora. She had come across a puzzle she was having difficulty solving. Still not too sure why she couldn't figure this out. She's been going to Hogwarts for years and I just got here like yesterday, but hey, maybe not everyone has mastered advanced spells like Lumos. Soon, I had finally reached the exit of Hogwarts. Near the door, I came across a disturbing field entry guide known as the Flattened Armor. It apparently belonged to a man who challenged a mountain troll to a game of musical chairs. I didn't even know they played musical chairs, and by the look of his armor, they don't. Stepping outside of Hogwarts for the first time since arriving was a sight to behold. The beautiful mountain scenery, the magically automated watering cans, the lush greenery, it was all quite astounding. I was taken aback by nearly everything I saw. A Thestral carriage? Musical flowers? Hopping mushrooms? A drunken bystander? What a place. After harvesting what I came across and looting strange bags of money along the way, we arrived in Hogsmeade. I had a whole lot of important stuff. <gasps> cat, 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 cat. I had a few important stops to make, and I started with the most important. It was finally time to have a wand of my own. Heading into Ollivander's, it was time to be chosen by my wand. After a few failed attempts, we found the one that was right for me. Phoenix Core, 11 and 3 quarter inch, beech wood, ribbed for her pleasure. Tomes and Scrolls was the next stop. While there, I found myself hoping that the migrating books found peace and comfort in their new home. The shopkeep, Thomas Brown, was kind enough to provide me with a small potion station and a small potting table. I thanked him by telling a quality joke. Call me Harry, because I'm about to be a potter. And then was on my way. I next found myself at Pippin's Potions. I wanted to be in and out, but Perry Pippin really wanted to talk about how awesome potions were. Is it not the most fascinating art potion making? Rivals anything you can do with a wand, I've always said. Are potions really that versatile? They may not be as showy as spell work, but make no mistake. Uh, thanks, man. I'll just take the Adorus potion recipe and the Wigan Weld potion recipe that I came for. I'm kind of broke, and I'm kind of new here. Finally off to our last shop, we headed to the Hogsmeade location with the cutest name of all, the Magic Neep. <laughs> the Magic Neep. After casually stealing what I could only assume are his coins, the shopkeep Timothy Teasdale provided me with the Ditney seeds I came for. His stall provided various seeds and herbs, and as a vendor, he seemed so nice and personable that I almost felt bad for pocketing the money sitting next to him. Then I remembered, it's his own fault for just leaving it out in the open like that. I'm pretty sure he wanted me to have it. With that, I was finally done shopping. I stopped to meet one last shopkeep before heading back to Natty. A decision I very quickly came to regret. Oh, 
Oh, Snelly, why aren't you studying to be an aura? But I showed them. They're stuck in the dust at the Ministry and I'm here thriving. <laughs> Absolutely thriving. But look at you. Look at you. I can certainly see why you paid me a visit. Hey, what the f Happily free of that nightmare, I found Natty relaxing in the town square. Natty suggested we explore a bit more. Now, not all witches and wizards are as perceptive as I am, so some may not have noticed this when it happened. Due to the thunderous rumbling of the ground and the explosion of a brick wall, I knew something dangerous was afoot. That's when I faced my biggest and most exciting challenge yet, a massive and armored cave troll. Most wizards would have turned tail and run, but not Senpai Huckus. Not me. I was born for this. The troll was formidable, but my secret lab gaming chair, 16 ounces of G Fuel, and 400 plus hours on Elden Ring a few months ago guaranteed my victory. Though I quickly found myself a bit concerned for Natty. You're doing great, Natty. Oh, N Natty, Natty, you got this. But she pulled through in the end. With the troll weakened, a tingling sensation crept into my body. My wand hand began to pulse with power and I felt an energy unlike anything before swell up inside me. At first I thought it was the delicious Baja Blast I had at Taco Bell for lunch. But then I realized I was about to invoke an ancient magic attack. And when I did, the troll was completely obliterated. The adults were colored and pressed, and I was already making a name for myself as a wizard. Officer Ruth Singer was quick to congratulate me on my victory and promptly left with an apparition, probably off to tell the Ministry how amazing I am. After fully repairing the town square, Natty accompanied me to Gladrag's Wizard Wear and proposed we head to Three Broomsticks, aka the local pub, afterwards. Sure, I had a lot of study and catching up to do as a new student joining in the fifth year, but I just took down an armored cave troll and I need a drink. A few feet from the pub and guess which adorable little friend we spotted in the back of an alley. That's right, it was Ranrock. Oh my God, he's so cute, look at him. We overheard him saying, You said you could get to the child when they came to Hogsmeade that all you needed was a distraction. I gave you a distraction. To a sketchy guy named Victor Rickwood, which we'll meet formally in a moment. Now, I didn't run out of breath fighting that troll earlier, but for some reason I was quite winded after a light amount of spying. <sighs> Let's go. <sighs> Did they see us? I think I just need a beer. We were greeted as heroes in the three broomsticks. Serona Ryan was kind enough to provide Natty and me with butterbeer. I don't know if Natty is as broke as I am, but I could barely afford the beer, so I appreciated this gesture. Now, enter our friend Victor Rickwood. Victor Rickwood, who thought since the plan of having two cave trolls storm the town wasn't good enough, a better idea may be to just walk right up and say, hey, I'm going to kidnap this student. That'll work better. Except for some reason, it didn't work better, and wands were drawn about the pub. Rickwood drops one last threat before withdrawing. Can't drink butterbeer forever. Fine by me, I was hoping to switch to rum soon anyway. You and that me? concludes the first episode of my Hogwarts Legacy experience. If you enjoyed today's video, be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for more Hogwarts Legacy content. This is the first episode of many as I'm planning on narrating my entire playthrough. I hope I see you on the next one and good luck creating your own legacy.